Good morning, church. I wanted to take a moment, and I um, don't want to uh, in any way take away uh, from what was just shared with us, and thank you, Diane, and thank you, and our prayers are with you. Um, This is a difficult morning, I know. And I don't want to take away from that in any way um, by invoking anything personally or my family. I just need to just very briefly say thank you to those of you who have uh, contacted us or sent us cards in the loss of my mother-in-law. And uh, I not only thank you for that, but I also appreciate your patience because it was a relatively uh, short illness, a little over two months, and uh, that's taken a little bit of a toll on uh, me and, and on Vicki in terms of just trying to uh, deal with things that happened in another place that's not here, and we just moved here and yet drawn back there. And uh, So thank you for your patience. Um, I know that uh, the... Uh, Visitation and funeral last weekend took me away from here, and at the last minute, uh, I was able to rely upon our director of youth ministries, Ben Robison, to step up and to preach. He told me he had a sermon in his pocket ready to go, and I am grateful for that. Now, in a little lighter note... I would like to tell you that because Ben did that, I have a thank you note for Ben. It's always important to write thank you notes for folks, and so I have a thank you card and a thank you note for Ben. And um, I wrote this as I was watching last week's message. (laughs) And I understand that uh, at the beginning of his message... Ben said that, you know, you'd be in for a treat because the preacher of the day was so much taller and more handsome (laughs) than usual. So, um, as I was writing the note, I wrote this thank you note to Ben, and Ben, it not only comes with my sincere thanks, but there's also a little something in that for you. It's called a severance check. Anyone interested in joining the staff? (laughs) I am joking. Ben, thank you. If you were found to be alone on a deserted island, If you were truly a castaway, what would you want with you on that island? That's a popular icebreaker question that's often asked in small group settings just to get people to talk, just to create small talk. If you were alone on a desert island, what would you want with you? And and oftentimes when that question is asked, someone will follow up, well, what, what would be your favorite book? What book would you want with you? I would hope that for those of us who claim the, the name, the cross, and the cause of Jesus Christ, that we would want that book to be the Bible. But here's a, a question that has been asked by Bible scholars among themselves. Here's a question that's been asked by Bible teachers and by commentators through the years. And I found a recent discussion of this 
uh, in a devotional book I've been reading. If you could only have one book of the Bible, what would it be? Or if you could only have one chapter of the Bible, what would it be? Now, different scholars and teachers give different answers. But oftentimes, the one chapter of the entire Bible that church leaders and and Bible scholars often point to as being of tremendous value to the church as a whole and to Christians as individuals is the eighth chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. Romans 8 contains in it not only teaching that is vital for the church as a whole and for Christians as individuals. In other words, it's a theological chapter with important theological teaching and and biblical doctrine. It's not only a chapter that that encapsulates so much of the church's understanding of of who God is and, and who we are and what that relationship is supposed to be, but it's also a practical chapter because it contains practical encouragement And it can be used to equip us in the Spirit, in living for God through Christ. It has been referred to as the Great Eight, Romans chapter 8. And the message of Romans 8 is simply this. The world may tell us that there is no God. And frequently it does. The world may tell us there is a God. But that God is not on your side. That God is actually against us. He puts us through our paces. He makes us run through obstacle courses. He he makes us jump through hoops. He's always trying to To tell us, oh, you've got to do better. You've got to do better. He's always laying extra burdens on us, like the tricks that used to take place at at Bible camps when you would have a a, a, a knapsack or a backpack on your back and someone would keep putting rocks in the back of it and it would get harder and harder to walk with that more and more of that weight on your back. The world would tell us that's the kind of God, if there is a God, that's out there. A God that just likes to play tricks on you. A God that's always making you measure up. A God that can't be counted on. Because after all, look at all the tragedy around us. Look at the sadness and the suffering. Well, that's what the world would tell us. But the message of Romans chapter 8 is actually this. God is for us. God is for us for us, and you can emphasize that word, for. God is on our side. That's what Romans chapter 8 is about. And over the next few weeks, I want to invite you to journey with me through Romans chapter 8. We just finished up a sermon series out of Mark that was eight chapters long, and that covered a lot of ground for, for nine weeks. But this message series that we'll continue in through what remains of October and into November as we lead up to Thanksgiving, this message series will be looking at one chapter. And I want to encourage you to read that chapter this week. Read Romans 8. It doesn't take very long. But we're going to go back and we're going to really look at this chapter, discover what it is that God has to say to us today through the great eight through a chapter that proclaims to us and to all, God is for us. And that's our message series. And we start this morning at the very beginning of Romans 8. Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. I'll be reading out of the New International Version. If you'd like to read along in your Bible, you can, or with your Bible app on your phone, or you can read along on the screen behind me. And I'll invite you to stand as we hear God's Word together. 
Hear now the word of the Lord. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And this, brothers and sisters, is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you are our strength, and you are our Redeemer. In the name of the Word made flesh, your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. The Apostle Paul begins the 8th chapter of Romans by making three declarations about those who are in Christ Jesus. What does that mean for those that are in Christ Jesus? Well, simply put, if you are a follower of Jesus by faith, if your faith is in Him as God's Son, as the Savior and Lord. And if your faith in Him is both a mental assent to the reality of who He is, but more importantly, a life commitment to following Him for who He is, then you are in Christ Jesus. If you are a follower of faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, then you are in Christ Jesus. That's who Paul's talking to in this chapter. And Paul says, for those who are in Christ Jesus, we have certain declarations that we can stand upon. And you can follow along in these on your bulletin this morning. There's an outline for the message there. And you can see what these declarations are. And the first declaration is simply this. There is no condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I uh, want to show you a picture on the screen of an actress. Some of you may know her. Her name is Mary Lou Henner. Now, Mary Lou Henner started out as a, uh, an accomplished dancer uh, and did some choreography. Ultimately went into acting. She w- uh, was one of the stars of the TV sitcom Taxi uh, back in the 70s. In the early 80s, she was a movie star and she starred in some blockbuster films opposite of actors such as Burt Reynolds and John Travolta. Then she went on in the early 90s to play a a working wife uh, of Burt Reynolds again in a TV show called Evening Shade. She has been active in various forums through the years, one of which is a forum related to hyperthymesia, because you see, she has hyperthymesia. And what is hyperthymesia? Well, it's called total recall memory. She can remember specific details of every day of her life since she was a child. If you're ever on uh, the internet and you're on YouTube, you can find interviews with her on this subject because this, this hyperthymesia came to public prominence about 10 years ago when a lady named Jill Price wrote a book about it and revealed that there are about at least a dozen people in American society who have this gift. Um, Mary Lou has been interviewed about it because she's perhaps the most uh, prominent person who has this this gift, if you will. And if you ask her what was she doing on um, February the 8th of 1997, she can tell you what day of the week it was, she can tell you what she was wearing, she can tell you what she had for breakfast and lunch and supper, or what she was doing or where she went or who she was with. 
Now, that's pretty remarkable considering the fact that I have trouble remembering what I had for breakfast. <laughs> and I have to always remind myself where I left my keys and my cell phone. In fact, as I think about Mary Lou's Henner's gift, I think, boy, it'd be great to have that. What a great gift to have. Not only could I remember where my car keys were or remember what I had for breakfast or remember where I placed my cell phone, I could remember any number of things. I could remember what I was studying that day and bring that back to my mind if I was trying to prepare messages. Or what a great gift it would have been when I was in, in, in college or in seminary, you know, to have that total memory recall. Wouldn't that be such a great gift? Well, Jill Price, who is someone who has this gift and who wrote a book about it, and that's how it came to public prominence and how Mary Lou became uh, someone who talks about it. Jill Price wrote about having this gift in her book, The Woman Who Can't Forget. And Jill Price writes that you would think that total memory recall would be a wonderful gift, but she says there's another side to it. And I'm quoting her. Imagine being able to remember every fight you ever had with a friend. Every time someone let you down. All the stupid mistakes you've ever made. The meanest, most harmful things you've ever said to people and those they've said to you. Then imagine not being able to push them out of your mind, no matter how hard you try. Jill Price goes on and says, As I grew up and more and more memories were stored in my brain, more and more of them flashed through my mind in this endless barrage, and I became a prisoner to my memory. A prisoner to my memory. For Jill Price, that was a recipe for living under a continual sense of condemnation. Because with that total recall came the ability to recount everything she had ever done wrong. Every regret she had ever experienced. And she can't shut that out. Now, the truth of the matter is that a lot of people today live as prisoners of their memories. And people who do that do so without having hyperthymesia. You and I have experienced that, no doubt. No doubt there have been times when things have been brought up to us, perhaps by others, perhaps by circumstances that triggered memories, perhaps just simply by our own memories when we look back in time. We think about all the bad things we've ever done. Now, according to statistics, most human beings only remember 3% of their lives. Only 3% of the life that's behind you is stored in your brain in such a place that you can recall it easily. And it comes to mind with no problem. 97% of our lives is somehow hidden in the recesses of our brain. But 3% we can recall pretty easily. But studies indicate that of that 3%, most of those memories are either very good or they're very bad. And if we live with the memory of the very bad, then we can live as a prisoner of our memories with this constant sense of condemnation. If we dwell on all the things we've done wrong and all the regrets that we have, and yes, as we understand it as a part of the Christian faith, the sins we have committed, because sin is nothing more or nothing less than rebellion against God. A denial of God's rightful place in our lives and our embrace of the, of the attitude that I'll do life my way. I'll live it my way. I, if it's re in rebellion against God, that's fine. I'm going to live it my way. That's sin. 
And sin leads to sins. A little S on the beginning and an S at the end. Acts that are against God or against others. And not in keeping with God's character or who we are designed to be in God's providence. And when we think about our sins, that feeling of condemnation can come over us. We can begin to feel as though, how can we ever be good enough? And how can we ever find peace? This is why the Apostle Paul begins this chapter with this great affirmation, there is now, now, therefore, no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. There is none. There is no condemnation because God has taken care of things through Christ. Now, let's be clear when we're talking about condemnation and what we're talking about, okay? There's a difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction is of God, is specific, and leads to repentance. In other words, if there is something that you and I have done that has led us to violate God's will and God's way, if we've sinned, and even if it's a sin of an active sin or a sin of omission, something we failed to do, if, if that happens, God's Holy Spirit works in our lives to convict us of that sin. That's of God. That's God's way of pointing out that, that we have sinned, that we need to be aware that we've sinned, and that we need to deal with that sin. And it's always very specific. It's based on whatever that sin was or is. And it's designed to lead us to repentance. It's designed to lead us to say, God, I have sinned. I, I turn away from that sin. And I ask for your forgiveness in Christ. Now that's conviction. Condemnation. Condemnation from a biblical standpoint is of Satan. It's general and it leads to despair. You see, what Satan wants you to do is Satan wants you to remember every bad thing you've ever done and then believe that the cross of Jesus Christ isn't really sufficient to address who you are and what's happened to you and what you've done. And so Satan wants to bring that up and remind you of it. And so he's not going to remind you of just one particular sin, but a whole host of things in general. So that a feeling of despair and helplessness will come over you. That's a feeling of condemnation. And too many people today live with that feeling of condemnation who do not have to. Because again, if we are in Christ Jesus, there is now, therefore, no condemnation. The difference is found in confession. The difference is found in confession. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sin, if we're honest with our sin, honest with ourselves, honest with God, we admit it, we acknowledge it, we repent of it, we turn from it, and we seek the forgiveness that God offers in Jesus Christ, then guess what? God forgives and forgets. And a God who forgives and forgets is not a God who is standing over us, condemning us. And if God does not condemn us, who can condemn us? No one. No one. It's an opportunity for us to say, get thee behind me, Satan. You can't do it. And it's an opportunity for us to have a good self-talking to and saying, self, get over it. God says you are not under condemnation and you don't have to live like it. There is now, now, in the present tense, in what you're experiencing and how you're living and how life is going, there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. I'll tell you what, this week I read something in preparation for the message. I've heard it before, but somewhere along the line I forgot it. But it's an important reminder. In the economy of God, God's hammer doesn't have a claw. You know what I'm talking about? A hammer, which has a hard end on it to be able to nail nails, 
has a claw on the other end so that as you're nailing something into, say, a piece of wood, but then you realize, oh, you nailed something in the wrong spot or the wrong way, you can turn that hammer around with the claw and you can pull that nail out. Let me tell you something. The nails that were driven into the cross of Jesus Christ were driven by God's hammer, and God's hammer has no claw. He's not going to pull those nails out of that cross. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And a second affirmation that Paul makes is simply this. The law of the Spirit overrides the law of sin and death. Now, you know, we live by laws. And I'm not talking about governmental laws. I'm talking about the laws of the natural world. Okay? The law of gravity. We all live by the, well, we all live by the law of gravity, or as I've heard it said, we either live by it or we're broken by it. And I can attest to the law of gravity because one of my earliest memories is climbing a tree and learning that there is such a thing as a law of gravity when you're not hanging on very tightly. Now here's the interesting thing. In the natural world, we have a law of gravity. Okay, Things are, are, are attracted to the ground and they're supposed to stay uh, on the ground because we're pulled to the center of our world by gravity and we are held in place. And so therefore, we, we need to be on the ground. And yet, planes fly. Airplanes fly. Here's an illustration. This explains it. You see, there's a downward force of air, and the airplane is designed so that air splits at the front, air pressure is increased underneath, air pressure reduced on the top, and so there's an upward lift on the plane, and the plane is able to fly despite gravity. This doesn't suspend gravity. It just overrides it. The law of gravity is still in effect. It's just the law of aerodynamics makes soaring possible. You see, friends, there is a law of sin and death, and it is still in place. The wages of sin is death. Death in our relationship with God. And the law of sin and death says that you and I are sinners. We're sinners because we can't help it. We're born sinners. The theological, the theological doctrine behind that is the doctrine of original sin. It means sin originates in us. In other words, when we're born into this world, we are born into sin. We are born with an inclination to sin. Charles Wesley, in his great hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, calls it a, a bent to sinning. You and I are born with a natural inclination to sin. We can't help it. Born to it. And the wages of sin is death. Which means sin separates us from God so that we can't have a right relationship with God and thus can't experience life abundant and eternal apart from that relationship. So what do we do? We see the law of the Spirit, according to the Apostle Paul in verses 2 and 3 of our passage, the law of the Spirit overrides the law of sin and death. It overrides the law of sin and death. It doesn't suspend the law of sin and death, but rather when Jesus went to the cross and died for us, according to Paul, Jesus took upon himself our sins. Because Jesus is God in the flesh, living as we live in the flesh, Jesus, who became like us, went to the cross and died for our sins and thus overrode the law of sin and death so that now we override it because we live by the Spirit. Amen. We can soar. And let me tell you something, folks. That is good news. I don't know how many Christians I know who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, but they still live as though there is a sentence of death over them. They still live as though there's this this condemnation hanging over them. They're still living with the regrets and the baggage of the past. Let me tell you something. In Christ Jesus, you are not meant to carry baggage. You are meant to soar. And that is our inheritance as followers of Christ. Here's how Tim Keller puts it about these two laws being in effect, but they're in effect at the same time. Here's the reality. Tim Keller, who's a pastor in New York, says, 
We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we can ever dare believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe, yet at the same, very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. The laws don't change, but the law of the Spirit overrides the law of sin and death because of Jesus. And because of Jesus, we can override our nature and what the world throws at us, and we can soar by the Spirit. And that leads us to the third declaration that Paul makes, which is that as those who are in Christ Jesus, we live according to the Spirit instead of according to the flesh. We live according to the Spirit instead of the flesh. And what does that mean? Well, the Apostle Paul talks about living in the flesh, and Christians have debated that term for years, but when Paul is talking about living in the flesh, he's not talking about flesh and blood like our bodies. Some people have heard that and, and thought, well, maybe our bodies are just inherently bad. Uh, there was movements in the first centuries of the church for Christians to go off and deny themselves and, and live in the desert and, and deny themselves comforts and, 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 and deny the flesh any sort of... Uh, any any sort of, of comfort or attention in order to develop the spirit. Flesh is bad, spirit's good. That's not what Paul's talking about. When Paul talks about the flesh, about living in the flesh, Paul's talking about our human nature. He's talking about that, that propensity to sin that we talked about. That's what living according to the flesh is. It's living with this reality that we have a bent to sinning. And here's the reality. Because we are aware of our own human sinfulness, oftentimes we make living the Christian life, we, we make living the life of holiness unto the Lord about what we keep ourselves from doing or what we avoid rather than what we actually do or what we embrace. Mark Batterson is the pastor of National Community Church in Washington, D.C. And he's written a book entitled If. It's actually a book on if, the, the promises of God, and, it, and it's based on Romans chapter 8. It's one of the things I've been reviewing for the series. And he makes this statement. Making a decision against something is only half the battle. The other half is making a decision for something. If you're focused on what you shouldn't do, you probably won't do what you should. It's holiness by subtraction. And it doesn't add up to righteousness, which is actually going all in and all out for Christ. You catch what he said? Because of our tendency to live according to the flesh, we tend to live our lives for Christ in such a way that we define do's and don'ts. And we say, well, I'm going to keep from doing this. I'm going to keep from doing that. I'm going to avoid this. I'm going to avoid that. And I'm not taking anything away from that because the scriptures tell us to be careful. To be as wise as serpents but as innocent of doves, as Jesus said. We do have to be careful. We have to be good stewards of this life that we've been given. But here's the reality. When we live according to the Spirit, we are all in for Jesus. We are going all in, all out for Jesus, and it's all about Him, and it's all about being for Him, and it's all about living for Him, and spreading His good news, and sharing that news with others, and abounding, because Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. You and I are meant to soar. We are not meant as followers of Jesus Christ to live under a general cloud of condemnation that comes from either the world out there or Satan at work in us 
or our own human weaknesses. We are meant to live in confident victory through Jesus Christ. We are meant to soar because Jesus has overridden the law of sin and death in what he has done on the cross. And you and I are made to soar. And by soaring, we are meant to soar everywhere, every place, all the time, all in for Jesus. So that life doesn't just have to be, I'm living for Jesus, so I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to avoid that. Now, don't get me wrong. Again, yes, as stewards of our bodies, God's temple, as stewards of the life we've been given, and we're bought with a price, yes, no no doubt about it, there are going to be things we need to avoid and things we need to stay away from. But we can't define our lives only by what we say no to. We must define life by what we say yes to, and the yes and amen is Jesus Christ. And when we embrace Christ and the fullness of Christ, and we allow Christ to become everything for us by taking all of us, by experiencing his sanctifying grace, which not only fills us with his love, but equips us to do his work. When we experience the fullness of life in Christ, we escape condemnation. We soar through life. We live joyfully and abundantly. God is for us. And God is for you. God is for you so much that he wants you to live a life free of condemnation. A life that soars. A life with meaning and purpose. A life filled with him. That's the life he offers. The Apostle Paul starts out this great chapter of the Bible with this reminder. And as we start out new chapters of lives, whether we're starting a new chapter of life because it's a harvest season, turning to the early signs of of winter, whether it's a new chapter because we're experiencing changes in our family, changes in education status, changes in financial situations or jobs, or or whether you're experiencing new chapters because of, yes, loss of loved ones, or even new birth, or maybe even the reality that the days we have left are, are numbered. Whatever chapter we're beginning, we're to begin that chapter the way Paul begins chapter 8 of Romans. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Because we've been set free. I invite you to join with me in prayer. Lord God, as we come to the conclusion of our service, we come grateful for the fact that you're for us. You are for us. In fact, your word reminds us that you loved us so much you gave us your son, Jesus. And in Jesus, in his life, his death, and his resurrection, we have all we need to live abundantly in the here and now as well as eternally with you. Lord God, I pray right now for those who are here. As we begin this message series, as we open this new chapter, I know that many of us are experiencing turning the pages in our own life. In the new chapter, some of which can seem some of which can seem exciting, but many of which can be filled with anxiety, even fear. I pray, Lord, you'll be with each and every one gathered here all of us together as we enter these new chapters. Lord, for those who perhaps are still struggling with what it means to truly be set free of sin, of its penalty, of its fear, of its weight, for those who who are longing for salvation from what life is and what sin has done to it, Lord, may this be the day. 
that they come to know Jesus, your son, as Savior. But also, Lord, there may be some among us today who, even though we've, we've committed our lives to Christ, the Holy Spirit is, is working in us as a resident, but not as president. The Holy Spirit hasn't completely filled our lives, and because we're still sort of caught into the thinking that maybe we're not good enough, or maybe we need to do more, or, 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 or maybe we, we've got baggage that, that we don't know what to do with. Lord, I pray this would be the day that they would experience your sanctifying grace. Grace that, grace that enables us to lay down every burden, every anxiety and care, and be so filled with you that life becomes not only about the power to avoid sin, but the power to, to aggressively combat it and to, to live abundantly in Christ, presenting Christ in what, what we say as well as how we live. Lord, I pray this is the day for them. And if there are those, Lord, who are struggling this day with need, need and comfort, Help us, Lord, to receive that comfort of your spirit because life in the spirit is a life of comfort, a reminder that there is more to this world than this world because in this world, we're simply in a training ground for the next because one day you want to welcome us fully into your presence. Why? Because you're for us. You are for us in Christ and you are for us this day. As every head is bowed and every eye closed and we're ready to dismiss, I just want to give you a chance this morning. If you are in need of prayer for a struggle you have to raise your hand. No one's going to see that but me. But I want to see if you are in the midst of a struggle where you need justifying grace, sanctifying grace, or life in the spirit of comfort. Thank you. God bless you. Lord God, you've seen these hands and I want to specifically, Lord, Pray you pour out your spirit on them. Answer their need. Meet their needs, Lord. And all things remind us that you are for us. As we go forth now, Lord, help us to be for you in everything we do in every place you put us. For all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you for coming. Remember, we have a baptism class at 6 o'clock on Wednesday night right before our midweek study. And remember, we're starting a church membership class next week. If part of living abundantly is wanting to come to baptism or church membership, you're invited to do so. Until next week, God bless you. Amen.